Welcome and thank you for joining us for this Flinders University Meet the Minds, highlighting the unseen, bringing frail, homebound and bedridden people into view with technology. I'm Chantelle Crossman. I'm, I'm the Manager of Partnerships and Events at Flinders and also part of the Meet the Minds team. I'm excited to host today's event as we explore technological health solutions to empower and create more effective health, health and wellbeing services for frail, homebound and bedridden Australians. To begin with, I'd like to acknowledge that we're hosting this forum on the traditional lands of the Ghana people and that we pay respect to our elders past, present and emerging. And we also acknowledge and convey our deep appreciation to the elders of all nations upon which Flinders operates. This event is delivered as part of our Meet the Minds Lunchtime Lecture Series, where we will meet some of Flinders University's most engaging minds as they bring you their latest research from a diverse range of fields. Today, we're fortunate to be hearing from Dr. Maria Alejandra Panera de Plaza, a postdoctoral research fellow in a joint position with Flinders and the NHMRC Centre for Research Excellence in Frailty and Healthy Aging. Dr. Panero de Plaza's work explores the design, implementation and evaluation of fundamentals of care and knowledge translation. The research we're talking about today focuses on her investigations into the experiences of frail, homebound and bedridden people, often who are trapped inside their homes with serious health or mobility issues with no treatment or support inside. These people live with complex, incapacitating and debilitating illnesses or injuries, and Alejandra is exploring how technology can play a part in improving their care. As always, we're keen to make this an interactive event uh, with a live Q&A session, so it's your chance to participate in the discussion and to po pose questions to the speakers in real time. We do ask, however, that everyone please treats this forum as a place of respectful engagement, where people are treated with dignity and where differing views are tolerated. We're ready to start receiving questions now via the message function on this platform, so please um, submit your questions. And so now it is my pleasure to invite Dr. Maria Alejandra Panero de Plaza to speak. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chantel. I'm so excited to share with everyone the research that we have been developing for the over one year and a half. So let me click. OK, the topic. Very important, this is a study, we are talking about meeting the minds, but you are not meeting just my mind or my research. This project has been developed with the people, the populations, different populations affected by these issues. So let me walk you through my presentation first. So we are going to explore the research problem at the beginning of the presentation. We are going to see exactly what are the barriers, the current barriers that make this actually a real problem impacting every Australian. The research approach, we're going to talk about what, how we as researchers and the people that are working with us are planning to address this problem and what have we been doing at the moment. Then we're going to talk about the characteristics what we found in connection to the experiences of frail, homebound and bedridden people in Australia. The current situation, so the latest, what is going on? Is this still a problem? Are we disconnected from reality? We're going to see that. And of course, we're going to check on all the opportunities we have you as a listener, whether you are a consumer, you're a member of the community, you are a researcher, a practitioner, a technician, a philanthropic person that wants to make a difference. Here is the opportunity for you to understand what are we planning, how you can be engaged with us and the future. Of course, your questions. So first, the research problem. Here we're going to see a video, very short video. This video was developed in co-creation, partnership with consumers. They will talk here through their experiences about what is going on and what we can do about it. So let's click on the video. Highlighting the unseen, frail, homebound and bedridden people. Imagine living in a never-ending COVID-19 lockdown, feeling alone and socially isolated, 
not because of the virus, but because of mobility or health issues. A lack of help and increasing dysfunction is the reality for many Australians. Even the most essential things become hard to access. Basic medical care is beyond reach because their physical attendance is required. This is a real state for many people. This is the unseen reality that frail, homebound and bedridden people face every day. Being frail, homebound and bedridden means being trapped and unable to leave home. But it doesn't have to be this way. Together, we can make a difference for these Australians. They are just like any one of us, our family and our friends. Anyone can have a change in circumstances and so become frail, homebound or bedridden. They need social and health inclusion programs, care, love and support like the rest of us. They do not want to stay trapped and unseen. Before their health issues, they were active members of the community, working as entrepreneurs, doctors, musicians, defence personnel, dancers, students and much more. They need to be treated with dignity, respect and deserve inclusion in opportunities adapted to their circumstances. Bring light to frail, homebound and bedridden people. By sharing this information, they deserve to be highlighted and included like the rest of us. To read more about their experiences, challenges and their proposed solutions, visit facebook.com Australian FHBP. So this is an important part. We thank all the frail homebound and the rhythm people and also clinicians, experts, technicians that help to edit and format this video so that you can get awareness about the, uh, their unseen situation. So let's highlight moving the presentation. The dimension of this problem, what we're talking about here. In 2018, this information is from the Australian Bureau of Statistics. Almost 4 million people, 3.9 million Australians, had a limitation with the core activities of communication, mobility, self-care, school, schooling, employment restrictions. So big quantity of people is affected. How many exactly will be defined as homebound of the reader? We went deep, deeply, deeper into the data and we found that approximately 600,000 Australians and probably many more because this is data about disability and you will see later in this presentation that this is not only disabled people. There are many diseases that are not considered disability. They are included within this group. So these people do not leave home as often as they would like to due to their disability and condition. Then we think, OK, we are talking about an older people, just the people. The, the, well, no, that's a generalization that is wrong. Here we have more than half of the 600,000 people are people aged between 5 and 64 years old. That's interesting. Here we see to the right, a guitar and a hand. This is a photo provided for a person from a person that was self-identified as homebound bedridden. We asked them to share pictures of their hands in connection with images that represent their life, whether it's now that they are homebound or perhaps in the past. Let's see, do we have issues then with older populations? Yes, almost half of these 600,000 Australians are also aged between 65 and more. And we have a picture again from one of the, our consumers, we call consumers the people who uh, benefit from research and medical services. They also call themselves health consumers. So what's the problem exactly? Like the video was saying, many Australians from such groups do not receive support or access to clinical services, or even have a regular primary care provider, such as a GP. What are the barriers? How come this is happening? 
Well, the federal government, in terms of solving this kind of problem, the Royal Australian College of General Practitioners and the community agree on the importance of digital technologies. What we mean by that, mobile phones, tablets, wearable devices to enable remote healthcare delivery, telehealth. And after the COVID-19 experience, we all know that this is possible. Actually, the COVID-19 National Health Plan included telehealth for everyone in Australia. And we will see, we have seen actually many consumer reports and several institutions have presented information about how this was fantastic and beneficial. However, on July 2020 last year, access to GP via telehealth services was terminated for people who had not attended face-to-face -face appointments within the last 12 months. So we wonder why? We have your response. Media publications from the federal government, the Royal Australian College of General Practitioners, attribute this lack of access to primary care services to the absence of evidence-based knowledge about how to address these problems. Remember that before, these telehealth services were mostly focused on remote communities, so we don't really know. People are not familiarized with using them. Even the consumers, the same happened with practitioners, clinicians, nurses. So the government indicates now that they continue to work with big bodies to co-design. This means working together. Uh, so to, to design these post-pandemic uh, telehealth solutions as part of a broader primary care reform to modernize Medicare and provide flexibility and access to primary and allied health care services. This sounds fantastic. What is happening? How can we join this? So within this idea, we want to make this a reality now. So within this context, our team has the vision of bringing the gaps concerning healthcare and social inclusion issues experienced by frail, homebound and bedridden people. What exactly we need to resolve? How did I get to this question? So here we have Ricky Buchanan at the right side of the screen. Ricky Buchanan is a very well-known uh, consumer advocate in terms of people with chronic diseases. She has been bedridden for several years. She, re she took half an hour each day of his time because she has a limit and a condition that limits her energy so that she could write a report of what she has been experiencing. So the, this was written in 2018, the link is there. What is the main issue that I could identify from there? The entire medical system has been designed and based around physical attendance. This is quoting her. Now how she feels about it. I feel like we are just invisible. Like this problem isn't on anybody's radar because we, because nobody knows we exist. So again explaining what is happening if you don't turn up you are assumed not not to need or want the service if you are homebound bedridden and you live in the community then the healthcare system treats you as if you don't exist key point many australians do not have access to primary care what does this mean well we wanted to bring a solution. There are many scientific ways and approaches that we can take, but we think that the most important way that we can address this is not necessarily a top-down approach where only clinicians and politicians and experts think about a solution. We think the solution has to come from the root we engage with consumers as researchers. Here we have at the right side of the screen at the top, Penelope McMillan, another famous consumer advocate. So how do we get in contact with each other? Penelope and I used to work together trying to, well, we still have, uh, we still are uh, engaging many um, consumer engagement advisory groups. Initially, we worked for almost two years for Sunbury. And we used to be members of the Health Consumers Alliance group that unfortunately disappeared. 
So I gained this beautiful role with Flinders University, the Caring Futures Institute, and the CRE in Frailty and Healthy Aging. I was in contact with Penelope and she mentioned Ricky Report. This is key in terms of research about care, about healthy aging. So we get in contact with Ricky and we, the three of us thought, how can we change this? And out of passion, <laughs> we designed this research program together and we applied for a grant that hopefully, oh, well, actually uh, Flinders gave us the grant and we developed the media communication that you just saw, many other things. So what is this approach of consumer research? They call it uh, citizen science. Is it also involved transdisciplinary research, many big words. What means transdisciplinary participatory research? Well, this means that in our studies, we combine all type of experts, including consumers as experts, and their skill to meet share outcomes. Here, all the experts that have been working with us, uh, and we have many others as well that are not listed here. So we empower health consumers as peer co-researchers in the process of co-creating comprehensive solutions to issues of, what is of utmost importance for them. Why this is relevant? Why in this way? Well, because in this way we can address the gaps that actually obstruct the assistance and care required for from homebound and bedridden people. If you think of this not only as a health issue or ethical imperative, from a sociopolitical and economic point of view, addressing this problem is a necessity because it has medical and social implications that translate into increased costs for taxpayers concerning disabilities, social, medical, mental health expenses for Australia. And this is not me saying that, that was in the identified by Ricky and other people. If we do these things more effectively, we save money for all of us. Again, exploring how come this interconnection transdisciplinary research is being implemented in this project. So our first bit is peer inclusion of frail homebound and bedridden people, including citizen scientists, that's a way to call them, as co-authors. We are not just consulting them. They sit with us design the research questions, apply to ethics with us, our peers with us in, in academic presentations, even Penelope have been presenting uh, for us everything that we have been developing. So we create awareness materials, that's important because if we want to change policy, if we want to get to different people that have decision making power, then we can create awareness and understanding of what is going on. In terms of the scientific approach, the research bit, we have been co-creating methods for measuring and evaluating this process of participatory research. Look, this is, idea is not new, but at the moment it has been pushed a lot because funding bodies want to see, well, you're doing this, tell me, how are you investing the money and what is the impact, the benefit? So we together are designed, put together theoretical and empirical and validated tools and approaches to design a methodology, a framework and a tool to assess this in a scientific manner. This is the link to proliferate our evaluation framework and we have to share with you very exciting news. We are computerizing and standardizing proliferate so it can do this automatically. So I invite you to check on several links that I'm going to share with you but let's keep going. Something really important, a sustainability network. Doesn't matter if we create all these solutions and tools and we don't have a way to implement it within the system. We have the people that actually are involved hands on in this. So we have consumers co-researchers, as I mentioned, MECFS Australia, MECFS Australia. What is MECFS? It's myalgic encephalomyelitic chronic fatigue syndrome which you will see later that they are highly affected by this situation. Non-for-profit industry partners. Other conferences that we have been uh, presented attracted so many people. They are experts in technology, experts in different things, and we are open for you guys. 
come work with us. So the Help Me Fit Foundation and Apple, they are working in systems that are, that are possibly adaptable to this. Flinders University, the heart health team, specifically Norscora app, which is an app that can interact with consumers and teach them and how to prevent and, and improve their health. The Caring Futures Institute leaders, we have team leaders, thought leaders in different areas of care and health. The Health Analytics Research Collaborative and the Health Translation SA are partners the Geriatric Medicine at Queen Elizabeth Hospital, the Central Adelaide Local Health Networks, the National Health and Medical Research Institute, Center of Research and Excellence in Frailty and Health Care. So I think we have been working a lot uh, with a good network. So we are publishing evidence. We published the first study in the field. What are the characteristics of frail homebound of urban people? They are trapped and unable to leave home. We did a survey. We found that 9% are males, 81% females, 24% are excluding an accident or a temporary illness and permanently unable to leave their home. 11% are bedridden. They cannot leave their bed. 53% need to stay in their bed most of the time. One in three live alone. Imagine that put all together these 42% are single, 22% have children, and three in four are unable to leave the house most of all the time. Other characteristics in terms of how they feel, they feel their health is much more poor compared to other people their age. And these are their ages. Again, there are many assumptions about them being only old people also assumptions about people being lazy and educated and staying home. Look, we have highly educated population in a productive age time. What are the impairments? Physical impairments, neurological, sensory, mental, immunological. This is in order of importance. 66% reported three or more diagnosed conditions. These are the conditions. I'm moving quickly because I need to uh, progress the presentation. If you want later, we can address these issues. So again, support, very important. Unpaid support from a family member, national disability insurance, other known self-funded assistance, that's the case, aged care packages, location, where are them? Here, of course, this was an online survey, so we see this order of participation and most of them are unable to work. Again, important things, they need help with their personal affairs, center legal claims, insurance. What is the deterioration of their well-being and diminished capacity? Social isolation, diminished family and community life, overall health, capacity to reach out, capacity to work, capacity to study, capacity to health services, disability, uh, development of additional disabilities because they are they are not receiving support. Short term conditions become permanent in the inability to recover from injuries and violence. We are talking females. Today, yesterday, actually, this was the government say the people with mobility should, should, should get their jobs at home. But the, what doctors say that there is a gap that currently that's not possible. And this was yesterday news, so this is the current situation. And that they are not models, they are not ways already established to support this. So we conclude here that they are underserved, under researched Australians, many of them afflicted by several chronic conditions, rare diseases, they are not considered disability, that's why they don't receive support, and they are likely to become more prevalent. We have long COVID immobilizing people around the world. So this is something that we have to take into consideration. Here, I won't read this to you because again, we, have, we are short of time, but these are all the needs, please come back and check them. And then what is the future? So nationally and internationally, these kind of projects end up as a pilot. There is not 
integrated into the people that can solve this kind of problem. What we have, we have a five year plan. We have a transferable scientific approach. We will co-design with homebound people and experts, the best technology. We will test them scientifically for improvement of healthcare inclusion, health and well-being, and we design an escalation plan. So this can actually be embedded within the health system. That will reduce cost. So we are open for you to invest in this. This is not something they pull out of one hat. CSIRR, the government, the industry already reported these studies would, are so important for Australian technological sectors to progress and help. The kind of tech solutions, all the things are responding to the needs of friend home vulnerable people. So again, come visit our presentation. The results that we have, well, the video, advocacy and awareness, academic peer review publications, open access information, a website about the program, teaching, supporting. So the future involves a lot of things and you are invited and welcome to make a difference with us. <laughs> Thank you so much. I really appreciate your time today, Dr. Pinero de Plaza. We, we don't have much time left, but um, I thought we could get to one of the questions that has come in. Um, it, it reverts back to sort of the start of your presentation. So during your research uh, into frail homebound and bedridden people, you worked alongside health consumers themselves. And what was the importance of incorporating a lived in experience into your work? Yeah, I think this is fundamental. And that's what makes a difference when we think about technology, just think about how things in technology have been progressing so quickly. It's because they do studies that they call it an user approach. They put the consumer at the center. And we have been saying this in health research, but it's not happening. So this makes a difference because we can identify exactly where are the gaps. And it's not just us saying what's important how to solve the situation. It's involving them so they know. It's involving the clinicians so they know. So if we all work together, these complex and wicked problems that we have in health can be solved because we, we, we don't have just one angle. We have the full view of the problem. And, and just quickly, who are the people that you need to listen to and how are you planning to bring them on board with investing in technologies? Well, to listen to, of course, the consumers and the experts in technologies and the clinicians, all of them, we have to listen to each other. And in terms of the people that I want to hear what we are doing is founding bodies, technological people, look, we have already a couple of apps that could be co-adapted. We have a big group of consumers already and we are open to receive others. We are open to actually invite policymakers as well because we have to co-create this process of change. So we are open to hear from you. Funding bodies, philanthropic people, please help us because the structure is there. What we need is the money to progress. And just just quickly, one more. Um, what have we learned from COVID um, now that telehealth and technology, um, you know, can support people in this situation? Yeah, we learn a lot. What we what have been demonstrated is that we can overcome all the barriers that we thought that were impossible. We see now consumers happily interacting with doctors. What we need now is to teach actually health practitioners, service providers, that how to do this properly, how to provide these services. This is possible. COVID-19 has shown us that we can do it, so let's do it because it's an emergency. Yeah. Thank you so much uh, for your time today, Dr. Pinero de Plaza. Um, and thank you to our audience for your interest um, and your input into this, um, this event. You can watch this session again on the Flinders YouTube channel or the Flinders University Meet the Minds webpage, uh, where you can also register to receive notifications of our future events. 
Our next Meet the Minds lecture is on the topic of Australian marsupials and how they're often dismissed as primitive and boring. However, we're challenging that belief with Professor um, Vera Weisbecker on the 15th of June at 12.30 p.m. We hope you can join us. Thank you once again uh, today and have a great day. Thanks.